you'll recall, last week we started a series um, called My Heart, Christ's Home, based on the book by Robert Moyd, Boyd Munger. We got to a couple rooms of the home. We got to the, the study or the library or the office, the study of the mind. And then we moved on to the, the next room, which was the dining room, the room of our appetites. Today we're going to go further into the heart as we explore my heart. When we ask Jesus Christ into our lives, he came and set up camp in our heart. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more today. The living room was the next room that Jesus and I walked into. I wanted him to see the living room of my heart. We'd already checked on the study. We'd already checked on the dining room. And we move next to the living room. And this was a quiet, comfortable room, and it had such a warm atmosphere. Of course, it had a fireplace, and it had a sofa, and, and a few overstuffed chairs in it. It had a bookcase, and it just had that atmosphere, an atmosphere of intimacy. And Jesus walked into the living room of my heart, and he said, this is, this is a delightful room. Let's come here a, a lot together, shall we? It's so secluded and it's so quiet. And we can have good talks and we can have great fellowship here. Well, naturally, as a young Christian, I was overjoyed that he liked the living room. I couldn't think of anything I would rather do than spend a few moments every day with Christ in a close relationship in this room. He promised, I will be here every morning, and I'll be here early. So meet me here, and we'll start our day together. So morning after morning, I would go downstairs to the living room, and he would take a book of the Bible from the bookcase, and he would open it, and we would read it together. And he would unfold to me all the wonders of God's truth that were recorded on its pages. My heart would sing as he shared his word with me, and he would share all that he had done for me and all the things that were yet to come. Those times together were just precious moments, and through the Bible and through the power of his Holy Spirit, he would continue to talk to me, and in prayer I would respond. So our, our friendship deepened from that in those quiet times, those times of personal conversation. However, as goes life, under the pressure of all the responsibilities that I had, little by little, this time of fellowship together with him got a little bit shorter and a little bit shorter. Why? I'm really not sure. But somehow, I guess I assumed that I was, I was just too busy to give all that time to him, to give that special morning time to be with Jesus. It, it wasn't something that happened deliberately, mind you, but understand it, it just seemed to happen that way. And eventually, as in some of our lives, not only was that period shortened, but every once in a while I would miss a day. Matters of urgency demanding my attention were continually crowding out those quiet times of conversation that I had with Jesus. And it started to be that every once in a while I'd miss more than one day with him. And you know what, I could tell when I missed those days with him. And one morning I was running down the steps, ready to rush out for my next appointment. I was in a hurry to be on my way. And as I passed the living room, the door was open just a crack. And glancing in, I, I saw the fire in the fireplace. And there was Jesus sitting there waiting. And suddenly it came to me, you know, he is my guest. I invited him into my heart. And he has come. He has come to live with me. He's come to be my savior and he's come to be my friend. And yet here I am neglecting him. And I stopped and, and I turned and hesitantly I went into the living room of my heart. And I was kind of looking down, just a little ashamed, and I said, Master, I, 
I am so sorry. Have you been here every morning? Well, yes, he said. I, I told you I would be here to meet with you. Of course, that made me feel even worse. He had been faithful to me in spite of my unfaithfulness. And I asked him to forgive me. And of course he did, as he always done, as he always does, when we acknowledge our failures, when we acknowledge our want to turn from our sin and to do the right thing. And he said this to me, and it changed my life forever. He said, the trouble is that you've been thinking of this quiet time, of this time of Bible study, of this time of prayer, this intimate time with me, as a means for your own spiritual growth. Although that is true, but you have forgotten that this time means something to me as well. <laughs> Remember, I love you, and at a great cost, I have redeemed you. And I value who you are. I value this time together just to have you look. Look up into my face. Just warms my heart. So don't neglect this time with me because I want to be with you. I really, really love you. And you know, the truth that Christ wants my fellowship that he loves me, that he wants me to be with him, and that he waits for me in the living room of my heart, has done more to transform my quiet time with him than any other single fact. Don't let Christ wait alone in the living room of your heart. But every day, find a time, find a place when, when with the word of God and in prayer, you can spend that quiet time with him. It is important to you, but it's even more important to him. Go back in, the, in your minds for a moment at the time that you were first saved, at the time that you first met Jesus Christ, and you just wanted to learn more and more and more about Christ. About Christ. You wanted to be with him all the time. You wanted to be with his people. You wanted to be in fellowship. You wanted to be in the word and prayer. But then life happens, and it gets in the way, and things of the world start to crowd out your devotional time with him. And where at first you were spending lots and lots of time with him every day, and then gradually the fire starts to dim. Your devotional time starts to diminish just a little bit every day. You know, Satan chips away at that to keep that fellowship from happening. So ask yourself this question, how are we in our fellowship with Jesus Christ? Are we in prayer? Are we in the word and song? And I see we're in fellowship with other Christians, which is the body of Christ, which makes up the church. So praise God for each and every one of you that are here and those out there in cyberspace. But here's a couple questions I want you to take home with you. Questions we can kind of look at ourselves and ponder. When have you most cherished your times talking with Jesus? in the living room of your heart. When have you most cherished those times? Was it in the time of crisis? Was it in a daily routine of spending time with him? Think about this, that this week. When are the most cherished times you had talking with Jesus Christ in that living room of your heart? And the second question is, what distractions prevent this time from happening? What is it in your life that is so important that it takes you away from your guest, Jesus Christ, who you asked into your heart to spend eternity with him? What is so important on earth, barring an emergency, of course? But what's so important? It's interrupting that time that you have with him. Quick prayer. God, our greatest desire should be to meet with you regularly in the living room of our hearts. This time with you, Lord, is so important. We ask that you would forgive us for neglecting you in the past. And Lord, give us that desire to spend more time with you. 
My prayer is, my Lord, to be more like you. Amen. The next room we come to, the hall closet. Mm. (laughs) That's a scary room, isn't it? (laughs) That's one more, there's one more matter of um, crucial consequence. Because one day I found him standing and waiting for me at the front door. And he had that look in his eyes. I knew I was in trouble. But as I approached him, he said to me, you know, there's a very strange odor in this house. (laughs) Something smells like it might be dead around here. You know, it's coming from upstairs, and I think it's coming from the hall closet that's up there. Well, as soon as he said that, I knew exactly what he was talking about. And indeed, there was a small closet up there (laughs) on the hall landing, just a few square feet. And in that closet behind lock and key, I had one or two personal things that I didn't want anybody to know about. Certainly, I didn't want Jesus to get in there and find out about them. They were dead and, and rotting things left over from the old life. Not, not particularly wicked, but not right and good to having a Christian life. But yet I loved them, and I couldn't let them go. And I wanted them so much for myself, and I, and I was really afraid to admit that they were even there. But reluctantly, I went up the steps and came closer, and the odor became stronger and stronger. I was glad we had to wear masks. <laughs> but he pointed at the door, and he's like, It's in there. There's something dead in there. And it kind of made me a little bit angry. That's the only way I can put it, because I had given him access to every other room in the room in my heart, in his home, the living room, the, the dining room. And he was asking me about this little two by four place. And I said to myself, you know, this is just too much. I'm not gonna give him the key. Well, he said, because, you know, he can read your thoughts. <laughs> if you think I'm going to stay up here on the second floor with this smell, you're mistaken. And I'm going to take my bed out on the back porch or somewhere else. I'm certainly not going to stay around that. And I saw him start down the stairs. Well, when you have come to know and love Jesus Christ, one of the first things that could ever happen to you is that sense of him withdrawing his face from your fellowship. So I had to give in. And he says, wait, 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 wait. I will give you the key, but you'll have to open the door yourself. And if you want it cleaned, I'm not going to do it. I just don't have the strength. I just can't deal with what's in that closet. And Jesus looked at me with those eyes. And he said, I know you haven't the strength Just give me the key. Just let me handle this closet, and I will. Just tell me to handle it. And so my hands were shaking, and I passed the key over to him. And he took it from my hand. He walked over to the door and opened it. And he entered it, and he took out that putrefying stuff that was still rotting there. And he threw it all away. And then he cleaned the closet, and he painted it, and he fixed it up all in a moment's time. And immediately this fresh, fragrant breeze, kind of like the one that comes off of Lake Erie, (laughs) it swept through the whole house. The whole atmosphere changed. It was so victorious for him to do that, to have that dead thing out of my life. No matter what sin or no matter what pain you may have in your life, in your past, Jesus is ready to forgive. He's ready to heal you. And he is standing there ready to take the key from you and make you whole. Ephesians 5 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them, because it's shameful even to mention 
what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illumined becomes light. What do you have locked in the hall closet of your life, hall closet of your heart? You know, your heart cries home that you don't want anyone else to know about? Is it a sinful action? Is it hate, hatred, or maybe resentment? Is it pride? Is it an addiction? Is it a wrong relationship or unforgiveness? You know, they say that narrow is the way to heaven. There's just no room on that small pathway for all that excess baggage. So we need to seek it, seek forgiveness, and make it right. And here's a couple questions I want you to take home and think about this week. You've heard the commercial, what's in your wallet? Well, what's in your closet? It's a fair question. And why do we keep it hidden? Why is it so hard to give Jesus the key to clean that out so we can have that relationship, that perfect relationship? Because I can tell you, that when you are in perfect relationship with Jesus Christ, that that is where the blessings fall. That is where the prayers are answered. That is where you walk hand in hand through this lifetime with nothing between you. Looking into his eyes as you walk down that pathway of life. My prayer is, Lord, I invite you into my hall closet. There are so many things that I have hidden in there, things that I thought I had dealt with, but maybe not in a manner pleasing to you. So sometimes I give them to you and then I take them back. But help me to give these things, all of them, to you forever. And please, Lord, in your strength, clean it out. Renew my mind. Renew my heart. My Lord, my prayer is to be more like you. Amen. Wow. Gone through several rooms of the heart. There is more, but since hubby's back, I'm cutting this one short. But look at all the work that we have to do in our hearts to to be effective and to be in God's will. But wait, aha, there's one more thing that we have to do. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Jesus Christ now lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. As I was in my heart, Christ's home, with Jesus, a thought came to me, and I said to myself, you know, I've been trying to keep this heart of mine clean. I've been trying to do this myself and and make it available for Christ, but it's such hard work. You know, I start on one room, and no sooner have I cleaned it than I discover that another room is dirty. And I begin on the second room, and, and... No sooner have I cleaned it, and then it's dusty again. You know, I'm getting tired trying to maintain a clean heart, trying to maintain this obedient life. I, I, I just, I'm just not up to it. And I turned to the Lord and I said, Lord, is there a possibility that you would be willing to be the manager of this whole house and operate it for me just like you did that closet? Could I give you the responsibility of keeping my heart what it ought to be and and to keep myself doing what I ought to be doing? And I could see his face just become a glow. And he replied, I would love it. This is exactly what I came to do. You can't live out the Christian life in your own strength, that's impossible. Let me do it for you. Let me do it through you because that is the only way it's ever going to work. But he added slowly, okay, you're asking me to do this, so I am now the owner of your heart. 
Remember, I am here as your guest. I have no authority to take charge since this property is not mine. And in a flash, it all became clear to me. And I said, Lord, you have been my guest, and I have been trying to play the host, but from now on, you are going to be the owner, you are going to be the master, and I am going to be your servant. Ah, said Jesus, now you've got it. Now you've got it. And this is something that you had to figure out for yourself. So running as fast as I could, I ran up and got my deed out of the house, all of its assets, all of its liability, its condition, its location and situation. And rushing back to him, I eagerly signed over the title to the house, to him alone, for all time and for all eternity. And dropping to my knees, I presented it to him. Here it is, Lord, all that I have, all that I am forever and ever. Now you run the house. Just let me stay with you as your servant and as your friend. You know, he took my life, all of me that day. And just let me say, and I can give you my word, that there's no better to live the Christian life. He knows how to, to keep my heart and to use it. And you know what? That deep peace settled down on my soul that has remained for the last 40 years. And I am his and he is mine forever. And think back to that moment again when you first asked Christ into your heart and he saved you as his savior. Now give him the deed to your heart. Make him the Lord of every part of who you are. Give him complete control. Let us pray. Praise him, come on up. Lord, we give you all of us. Our heart now belongs to you. Father, you paid the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus, to be the owner, and we long for a love relationship with you. We give our lives to you and offer up ourselves as living, breathing vessels to be used by you. We renew ourselves to you, everything we are, everything we're not. We are yours, Lord. So may your will be done in our lives. Father, find us faithful even as you are faithful, our prayer should always be to be more like you every day, every action. And if you want to recommit your life to Jesus Christ today, this is the time to give him the title to your heart. Now is the time. We have an altar that, okay. You can come to the front of the stage. It's open to you now. There are people here that would love to come and pray with you, to come forward, for this is the first day of the rest of your life. And with Christ as the owner and the master of every room, every room that's in your heart, every part of your very being, this is the day of new beginning. May Christ himself settle down and be at home as Lord of your heart. Amen. Amen.